Thanks for braving the weather, folks. Last week, I think it was a good call that we didn't come. But nice, really nice to be together in person. Hi, friends online who smartly didn't brave the weather or are in many other places. Nice to see you. So yeah, as we get settled in, just a reminder that there is um, cushions, blankets over there. So if folks want to put like, for example, a cushion even beneath their feet, um, the floor is a little bit cold, or if you want an extra blanket, also you're welcome to sit on the Zafu in front of the floor. So in front of uh, us here on the floor, which is great. And yeah, we'll take our time a little getting started just before I left. Um, the house, a smoke alarm went off, which was like really exciting since nothing was cooking. So yeah, and I use as an opportunity. I, um, as some folks here know, I almost never drive, which is like a very unknown to drive here instead of bike. Oh, like, I don't know how this is going to go. And so it's started off that way. And then the rest was great. I found parking in front. Yes. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, I'm, I'm actually, this is a really sweet time to be here with you all. We're just in the middle of a CEB, Cultivating Emotional Balance teacher training. Um, so Mace actually did that teacher training a couple of years ago now. Um, yeah, and it's a sweet time because we have these students, they came together in June and had a week long retreat, six months kind of getting to know each other, being online. And then you come back to retreat together. There's just such a sense of kind of being in the flow and um, they are in day two of silence. So it's, um, yeah, it's really sweet to feel that practice field. And they're so fortunate to have this kind of atmospheric support as well. Like, I don't know about you all, I've never wanted to hibernate so bad as these last couple of days. I'm like, I'm going to sleep more. So that's kind of nice. Yeah, I appreciate it. I think it's, I think it's good. Um, and we are going to continue here. Storytelling time with old path, white clouds. And in this book, which is the historical telling of the Buddha's life, we're getting into, I, I would say, I mean, it's all good, uh, but it's really interesting when we start getting into the chapters of how he first starts learning meditation and the skills that he uses and like learning for the first time, what is dependent origination, learning the limits of just concentration. So, um, and also him dramatically leaving his young wife and small child, which, you know, there's some controversy there. So very exciting night with our text tonight. And we're going to do a practice, I think it relates, it, it's a little challenging to find practices that directly relate to the chapters we cover, but, but this one I think is always meaningful and in the context of um, really understanding and starting to loosen the strong sense of identification with our experience. Right. If Buddha is always or Siddhartha is always looking before he becomes a Buddha. What are the true causes underlying suffering, underlying these feelings that we have around our daily life? And time and time again, it's this being kind of ensnared in the suffering of thinking that we are stuck in a fixed way of who we are, how limiting that is. And it's also very useful. So there's like a, a balance with it. But the practice we'll do tonight is mindfulness of feelings. It's a very core practice, um, kind of applying our mindfulness to our moment to moment experience and recognizing this real incredible discernment, recognizing whether or not we are experiencing what we are experiencing with a label of pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. And what's so interesting about this practice is I think most of us completely deny, ignore, or avoid neutral. Uh, one of my friends I'm teaching with, Tenzin Choki, was saying that neutral is like the waiting room. Like most of us live a lot of our life in neutral. And we're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. When will this next thing come, good or bad, that will kind of like be exciting? And so in this practice, of course, we're cultivating an ability to notice our aversion to what isn't good, 
maybe our, our grasping or attachment um, to what feels good, but it also gives us a chance to build curiosity, maybe even a little reverence for this waiting room area, or like neutral time. Um, so that's what we'll be practicing. I'm not sure, we're gonna do announcements at the end. You want them at the beginning? At the end? Okay, we're gonna do them at the end since I'm already kind of in, but I'll take a moment just to welcome you all to the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Welcome, welcome, welcome. And this is a volunteer run center. So amazing to be here truly out of generosity from the folks who are um, doing all the beautiful ways that we build community here, keeping the doors open, making the sound better each time. Um, so yeah, big bow and gratitude to all the folks who make it possible to be here. And it's such a goal uh, of us here who uh, volunteer our time at the center to create a place for the power of Sangha. We could all sit at home and read our own texts and watch YouTube for about 20 years and still have more Buddhist teachings, right? But that ability to be together and discuss and connect is so precious. It's so cool, right? These teachings do not come alive until we try them on. And one great way to try them on is hearing how other people experience them, asking questions, discussing. So that's our goal here. And Discussion and communication is a huge part of our practice. So just a reminder uh, for folks who I know are often coming here, or if it's a first time, that our real goal is that in our communication, we are also doing our practice, right? We are bringing forth compassion and mindful listening uh, for one another. So with that huge preamble, let's go ahead and get started with a practice. As I mentioned um, last week online, I had a really rich week of retreat and a lot of the focus was on posture. So I'd like us to spend a little bit more time with our posture as we get started. You can do this with your eyes slightly closed or softly focused open in front of you. Taking a moment to really feel the base of the body, where it's on the cushion or a chair. And to feel this sense of the base of our body being a source of strength and stability. Like the base of the mountain, it's the strength and stability on which we build the rest of our posture. So as we are rooting in through our sits bones, we're lengthening up through the spine. And it's often said that sitting in our meditation posture is like sitting on a throne. So feel or imagine that sense of dignity. And really notice how the spine can be even more upright, not in a rigid way, but in a clear channel from the base all the way to the crown. If there was a slipstream or a super highway from the heavens down to the earth, right down our spine, how could we make that more of a clear pathway? allowing the internal subtle energies of the body to flow more easily. That could be as simple as leaning a little bit forward or backwards to the side. And just noticing when we feel that sense of clear uprightness.
Gently tilting the chest upward. As though our heart were like a chalice. And softening through the muscles in the face, allowing the head and the face to have just the slightest downward tilt. And whether the eyes are opened or closed, inviting that gaze inward. And as I ring the bell to officially start the practice, see if you can experience and notice the sound and tone and resonance of the bell throughout your posture, the bodily posture, the mental posture, the full presence. And as we invite a settling of our body, our inner speech, and our mind, we can start to feel our awareness and attention more fully here in the body. As we inevitably notice the movement of the mind and distractions and ideas, images, we can invite ourselves to slip into what is called the fourth time. Letting the past just be the past. And really knowing the future is not ours to know in this moment. And the present is often bounded by just an experience of what we think we know. This other realm, this fourth time when we can touch into a sense of timelessness. Inviting that to be the stage in which we are practicing.
instead of feeling that our present moment is just wedged between what just happened and what is next to come. Feel an expansiveness, a spaciousness. As we make our way into this practice of mindfulness of feelings, we'll begin by taking a little tour of our senses, just so we can calibrate our attention and awareness for the practice. So beginning this tour of our sensory experiences by noticing the body right now. And see if you can notice somewhere in the body that feels unpleasant. Maybe an ache, an itch maybe something a little more sharp. I'm being curious about what makes this constellation of sensations get this label of unpleasant. And how does that unpleasant feel? And as we notice this unpleasant, we may notice it shifts or changes, becomes more or less unpleasant, maybe stays somewhat the same. And practice a kind of noticing in which you're not trying to change it or keep it in any particular way. Not holding on to it. Just this clear, curious observation, noticing an experience that almost automatically feels unpleasant. And then shifting our attention and awareness to somewhere in the body that feels pleasant. This could be quite subtle. This could be the sensation of warmth or a nice fabric feeling from our clothing. And with this clear curiosity, just being present with, noticing this whole constellation of sensations that are pleasant.
As we notice and become curious with our sensations, it may feel a little less personal. Maybe we're just noticing a warmth or a tingling, recognizing just this attribution of pleasant. And then shifting to notice and discover somewhere neutral. There could be a lot of areas of neutrality in the body. Try to choose just one. And really take on this task of clarity and curiosity. What is neutral feel like? We may notice with this attention, the neutral can become pleasant or maybe unpleasant. Helping us see that these attributions or labels we put on our experience, they're not the full reality of the experience. And then shifting our attention and awareness to the sense of sound, what is heard. Again, beginning by noticing a sound you might not like. Here in the center, there are many sounds arising and falling. Giving ourselves a couple moments to really notice as the sound emerges as a wave, we experience it. And again, that almost automatic attribution, unpleasant, don't like it. As much as possible, not having a discourse or series of thoughts about the sound and why we don't like it, just noticing that very simple level of aversion, pulling away, not wanting.
And shifting our attention and awareness and seeing if there's a sound that we notice that feels more pleasant, a sound we like. This could be very subtle, like our own breath. A low hum in the background of an appliance or heating. Again, noticing what it feels like to invite in and focus upon with clarity and curiosity, this pleasant sound. And as new sounds arise, is there a moment between our awareness of sound and an attribution or a preference of liking or not liking the sound? Really being curious about that awareness. And shifting once again to see if we can find a sound that is neutral, that we neither like nor dislike, have any strong feelings about. Of course, we will have distracting thoughts, memories, and images. Let's shift our attention and awareness now to those thoughts, not to be dragged away by them, but while being curious about our awareness in which the thoughts arise, notice the thoughts that we like, that feel engaging, juicy, and the thoughts we don't like, feel unpleasant, maybe contracting. And those mundane thoughts, neither here nor there, just floating through. Our first thought may be, am I doing this right? Notice how we experience that thought.
Again, as much as possible, being curious and even leaning back into the awareness in which these phenomena are arising. And then noticing that preference, that labeling, that creating of a feeling or story. It just comes on so quickly. If there's just so many thoughts, it feels like a rushing river, no problem. See if you can notice one or two and consider and reflect with this clarity and curiosity, whether you find them pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. And if the mind feels dull, maybe it doesn't feel like there's many thoughts or hard to identify, also no problem. Just notice the overall feeling tone of thinking or the experience of this mind and its sluggishness. And then inviting a more full experience of this awareness, opening our sense portals and noticing whatever we experience in the body, whatever we're hearing around us, and the thoughts that are coming and going, and observing them as passing phenomena and recognizing this attribution for each of pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. In this practice, we get to both train our attention, become precise and bright about the nature of our experiences. It also helps us with an investigation. The way that we respond to, react to, our attitude or stance towards sensory phenomena. With this curiosity and clarity, can we notice the phenomena in a more simple way? Loosen maybe this preference, this judgment. Possibly feel a bit of equanimity. 
the sense of everything that is arising and falling. It's simply phenomena. We like some, we don't like others. But can we rest in a sense of everything being basically okay? In our pure awareness of phenomena, is there okayness? Can we learn a great freedom born in each moment of feeling less tied to our preferences and judgments? And finding again that spaciousness of awareness If everything is already okay, see if there's an ability to be more present in this sense of spacious, open presence. even just a glimpse of unconditioned okayness, a freedom of our own ability to be with whatever is here can be so transformative. Just a couple moments more here. If you are imagining an existential level of relaxation in the body and the mind. Noticing these phenomena our preferences, 
And taking root, finding our home and awareness. And before we bring our practice to a close, from this space of exploring our awareness and phenomena, consider your intention and motivation for being here. What is the freedom you seek? What do you wish to support in yourself and others? Let it be completely new and fresh. Thank you for your practice. I didn't notice that until we started practicing. Friends online, there's like a, a little drip. And I was like, huh. Like, I thought it was like a diffuser. I was like, I don't smell anything. So, but it's funny because when I thought it was a diffuser, I was like, that diffuser sucks. It's really loud. And I was like, oh, how charming. It's a little hole in the roof or whatever. So, so much preference, right? And shifting in how I experience the world by what I think is actually going on. There's a big, there's a red bucket right here for friends online collecting rainwater. Oh. Yeah. Anybody else notice that drip? I need you. <laughs> it was like half our meditation in this room. Because um, it's not totally consistent. You're like, oh, waiting for, a oh, no, there it is. And then a double. And you're like, anyway. Anyway. Yep. Yeah. So, yeah. Any thoughts, questions, or reflections? How are folks in the room chatting? Is it with this? Yeah. Cool. There's a mic there. Who's our wonderful host online tonight? Thanks, Diane. Great. So yeah, if there's any folks online, I'm also happy to hear there. Um, but yeah, any questions, reflections? Anything you noticed other than the dripping in the bucket? Yes, please. I really appreciated your guidance. It was nice to be in person and thanks everybody for coming. Um, I really like the uh, attention to the posture. And that's one thing that I kept noticing throughout my set is that um, I think my head has a tendency to go up. So I would always come back and mm. try to readjust it. So, um, yeah, thank you. I was into that. And then just, yeah, the, the sounds were numerous. So <laughs> it was interesting to see which ones I gravitated towards and which ones yeah. I didn't. And then just, there was a lot of neutrality. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I think I have a tendency to just think neutral is pleasant, I guess. Like if it's not bad, then it's good. That's pretty good. And so, it, yeah, I was like, okay, well, maybe I need to explore that more. Yeah. Can I ask a question? Sure. Were, was there a a way in which you could notice before the preference, the experience, like that little subtle 
Yeah, maybe. I don't know what it was like, I guess. It's hard to describe. Yeah. Uh, but there might have been a pause. I think you reminded us to do that. Mm -hmm. And then I noticed it, but it was just like a second. I know. Yeah. And yeah. I don't know what was there. Really <laughs> good. Yes. Yes. That fundamental question, who is aware? Yeah. Right. Like that's a, I, I think you can meditate on that for like 10 years. Like whose awareness is this? Wait, wait what is a, whoa, <laughs> it gets really like trippy quickly. And yet mm -hmm. it's not, um, it's actually not that foreign, not that far away. So. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and then it, yeah. it took a long time, but at the end, it got really bright and nice and sweet. Pleasant, so yes. Oh, good. Yeah. Yeah. It's there. And it's like a great place to hang out. Um, 20 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no problem. And thanks for mentioning the posture. Yeah. I've heard this. I, I can't remember the teacher, but that when our head is tilting back, we get our, we're more caught in thought. And when we're still being forward, we're really dull. So I think that's interesting. Yeah. Any other reflections? I feel like I see Sylvia and Gina getting ready to say something. Is that true? No. Okay. This, I think this was in the chat. Okay. Actually, I just let folks know that they could raise their virtual hand because you can see that in the reactions or they could just chime in if they wished. Yes, or, or I, I'm happy to read chats if you, you don't want to speak out. That's what was in the chat. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. I had an experience where um, typically I'd have an, uh, a feeling and it would be like aversive, like there's this pain in my back mm -hmm. that keeps on going on and I would sort of fasten onto it. And then in response to one of your prompts, I just sort of letting it go. And there would be this um, two things. One would be this sort of explosion of like energy. It would be sort of like something got released that was very, and it was also very disorienting. It felt like I wasn't like like I lost my identity for a moment because it's like I had this identity of like I have a pain in my back. And, totally. And it's like I could fast onto it or I could turn or I could orient myself around it. And yeah. when I let it go, there was a sense of disorientation. So it wasn't mm. pleasant or unpleasant. It was kind of like just like I'm lost. What do I do? Where do I? Is this okay? Or what? So it was just interesting. So beautiful. Yeah. No, thank you for sharing that. And this truly is like a, a dream come true, I would say, in in practice is to have the experience. And and you didn't even have an idea about what it should be, yeah. right? To just have the experience of it's not good, it's not bad, but huh, it's definitely not this idea that my back hurts, okay. right? And, you know, I totally relate. I, I've mentioned before, I have a like herniated disc in my back and I always in like a little bit of pain. <laughs> you know, and that identification with it, Yeah, you know, we really, um, we get stuck and, mm -hmm. and it's interesting how all these little experiences of our sensory world kind of start creating this fixed idea of who we are and, and limit us, right? It's not that they aren't true. Like, yeah, I have a herniated disc in my back. It hurts. But that being the frame of reference of how I'm relating to everything, um, it's just, it's really, yeah, very powerful to kind of poke into it. Thank you. Yeah. Any other thoughts, questions, objections? No problem. I'm sure folks have done mindfulness of feelings before. This was like a little bit of the equanimity flavor with it, which I feel that mindfulness of feelings, I feel that feelings, I feel that mindfulness of feelings is always pointing to, right? It's asking us to notice this preference. And I, I often say about this practice, you know, this is part of the reason like I have a job and that mindfulness is taught globally. So when John Kabat-Zinn, who's, you know, the, godfather of modern mindfulness when he became most well known is teaching mindfulness to people with chronic pain people like me who identified with their pain and a, this simple ability to start identifying with specificity what's happening and making it not a problem 
released these chronic pain patients who no other healthcare provider wanted to deal with at all from this cycle of pain, right? And usually it's a reactivity. So not just that my back hurts, but it shouldn't, it sucks. Why is it happening to me? Why is it happening to someone? The whole kind of catastrophe, right? As he, he has called it. So it's interesting to think how this simple practice too is, is one that has liberated a lot of people from a lot of pain. So that's so interesting you were exploring that yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions or thoughts? Yes, please. Um, well, today something happened earlier. I know it's awkward. You don't have to kneel or not. That's <laughs> you are, what is it? What do you say? Uh, wrong religion. Anyway. <laughs> today I was waiting for the bus in the rain and I had just gone grocery shopping and um, the bags started ripping and my groceries were falling out and the bus like passed, like the bus driver looked at me and he was like, I'm driving. So in that moment, I was like the default. I felt like I was an actor who forgot my lines because I was like, I'm so mad right mm. now. Right. And then I was like, Oh no, it's, it's okay. And I started laughing actually. And I was like, kind of surprised. But the absurd, it was just so funny because I zoomed out and I was like, of course. <laughs> and then another bus came and I got on and I was like, oh yeah. And the same thing happened when I heard the like unpleasant sound. Mm. I was like, oh yeah, that's so annoying, right? And then I was like, no, it's actually, I can't, I'm not actually annoyed by it. Like, so recognizing the patterns, yeah, but also seeing them for what they are mm -hmm. and not being so intoxicated by them yeah <laughs> felt different today yeah so that's oh like I made. wow thank you oh my gosh I, I bow to your realization it's, it's true though right those little gaps like those little gaps um I'm not gonna lie on the way here where I was like one or two drivers because I was late who I out loud said were total assholes. I was like, you're an asshole. Just to me in the car. And then I was like, mm, really? Like, because you're late. <laughs> right? So it's just that way of constructing our reality. And that it is, it's such a habit, right? And um, a little bit, I don't think we're going to get that much into the book tonight, but a little bit here, um, when Buddha is first starting to try out these meditation practices, he discovers that though concentration gives him some tranquility, he kind of can transcend a little of the day-to-day -day hassles, they aren't getting underneath to the hindrances. They aren't actually like hitting down deep because we're not really like taking apart the full nature of like why are we so upset and we have in order to do that we have to really start questioning this i part of it right that construction of me who's mad at these drivers or the bus or has this issue and and it's just one of my other co-teachers who I tried to kidnap and bring here tonight, but it didn't work out, Ryan Redman, um, who's come here and taught before. He was, you know, sharing this famous quote that, you know, compassion without wisdom is bondage, uh, which I, I just think is so beautiful. And, and the wisdom there is about really knowing the causes of suffering. Like, and if we don't recognize what's causing our suffering, which is often that driver that bus right the way that we are reacting to the world as opposed to the world like it, i really believe in providing um some kind of just basic antiseptic and amelioration of the suffering to the world by teaching compassion alone uh, i got to teach many times in the healthcare setting one of my favorite places to teach very easy to teach compassion for suffering a much harder sell to teach emptiness, right? And no self. And so it's not that there's no benefit of compassion without wisdom, but it does, it is bondage because you're never going to get through these root causes of what your suffering is actually about. Um, so, yeah. And you saw it. It's so cool when we actually like get a glimpse of it, right? And, you know, the suffering, such a heavy word, but we think of these moments of when we're free and we know that that every, every moment we're not free when we're stuck in our stories 
and are trying to get away from what we don't like and keep close what we like and um, a lot of the kind of self-related criticism, negativity, comparison, that is certainly not freedom, right? And we can ameliorate it with some compassion. We also have to really kind of like look inside to its root causes. So with that, let's see what Buddha's up to. Um, any other, unless there's other, anything online, Diane? Yeah, folks? thank you. Maria wrote, I find it fascinating how experience changes from pleasant to unpleasant, depending on how I'm relating to it. For mm -hmm. instance, when I'm practicing with sound and thinking about impermanence or something related to practice, I find it pleasant to hear and play with traffic sounds. But normally I prefer the quiet or I have a slight aversion to the traffic sounds. Working yes. on my positivity bias around this. <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah, no, it's so true, you know, and it's, and this is so interesting. It's like, it's, it's very difficult to bring into conscious awareness how quickly we have that like aversion you know it's like we hear the sound we're not like oh well, leaf blower I don't really like that it's like oh, right like we're like immediately moving away from it and contracting the center where we're teaching it's like 24 7 leaf blower I swear to god I'm just like all right we're, this is dharma of leaf blower like I'm like it's raining what are you doing, what are we doing? Um, and so but that like relationship to it um, and some of it is biological right there's certain tones and frequencies that we don't, don't like um, and some of it is learned right so we have maybe different preferences in music that makes us feel good and different ways that we can um, actually I think bring into our sphere of liking so that's what Maria was mentioning that if she treats the traffic sounds as part of her practice she likes them more oh well, yeah, thank you. Thanks, Maria. So when we last left Buddha, there he was with like this gripping uh, pain in his heart. He knew, um, doo -doo -doo -doo. He, so essentially he discovers that his wife, Yasodhara, is pregnant. Um, and Siddhartha, he felt the ties that bound him to life in the palace tightening, right? Just, yes. What chapter? We are on chapter 11. Chapter 11 is a little thin, so we'll probably just cruise right through it. But it has a really nice title, Moonlight Flute. Um, and in chapter 11, it's interesting. It kind of gives us... There's like these little like breadcrumbs, the way that Thich Nhat Hanh has put these stories together. And in these next couple chapters, I feel like a lot of the breadcrumbs are Buddha recognizing impermanence. So in the chapters leading up, we were really seeing a lot of Buddha recognizing inequality and seeing how the way that the palace was organized, the Brahmin class was organized, it oppressed some and lifted others. And even those that it lifted were not happy, right? Even this system, which was intended to prefer and kind of make life good for a certain amount of people, there was so much infighting and corruption and exploitation within that. So he was discovering that there was nowhere where people had a free heart. And really seeing how this system, you know, the caste system um, in India created so much suffering for so many people. And in these next couple chapters, you see how he's also really starting to recognize impermanence and how little time he actually has or any of us have in a lifetime to pursue the way. And it's so interesting because I, you know, he found the way and now we get to study it. Uh, but he had some sense that there was this teaching, right? There was a freedom, which I, I find like a really subtle message here, which is like an optimism. You know, you can look around the world these days and not feel that optimism that there's a way through that there's a way out and fall into despair and he just has this spark which is i think why we're all here tonight that there is a path of liberation and i just yeah i find that really inspiring and so in this um in this chapter it talks about first mostly him hanging out with his contemporaries and um, so Udayin, Devadatta, Kimbila, Baidya, Mahamana, 
Palaji Anaruda. You'll recognize some of these names later become his disciples. But these are Siddhartha's friends who visited most often to discuss such things as politics and ethics. In addition to Ananda and Nanda, they would be Siddhartha's closest advisors when he became king. They liked to begin their debates with several glasses of wine. Giving in to his friends' wishes, Siddhartha often kept the royal musicians and dancers performing into the night. It's a different kind of politics, but not that unfamiliar. So there's some wine, there's some dancers. Um, Devadatta could wax endlessly about political matters, and Udayin and Mahayana debated tirelessly every point Devadatta made. Siddhartha spoke little. Sometimes in the middle of a dance or a song, Siddhartha would look over to find Anuruddha nodding off, half asleep, obviously wearied by the evening's activity. She would nudge him and the two would steal outside where they could watch the moon and listen to the stream. So we see that kind of these matters of the, like the estates, the, the state of the kingdom, the ethics, he found it pretty dull. It doesn't say it directly, but he just, he found it, you know, performative, right? And I think these earlier experiences in his life beneath the rose apple tree, seeing the inequality, recognizing, wow, I don't know if actually society and civilization has it figured out, you know, that yearning he has, it makes these like, um, you know, I, I really like the way we hear about politics in this time of India. It just, it's just gross, right? Um, and so, you know, you just kind of, they would just go out and Siddhartha would play his flute. He was apparently a masterful flute player, which he gave up when he became the Buddha. And almost always in these stories, it's the full moon, which as many of you know, um, Siddhartha wakes up on the full moon and just kind of this ongoing connection to the natural world, which we'll see him especially dip into when he first is taking his monastic vows in the forest. And the forest, as he says, the sky becomes the roof for me and the forest floor, my ground, and just that connection to the natural world. Um, and then, of course, the time comes when his wife will give birth. There's a really interesting section here when he, uh, he so earlier, of course, we, we read that his mother died in childbirth, right? And I mentioned early trauma, it's just the path of awakening, that little difficulty. And also that, you know, it's like an imprint on him. So he said, um, mm-hmm. Although he was separated from his wife by two walls, he could clearly hear her cries. With each passing moment, his anxiety increased. Her moans now followed one upon another, and he was beside himself. Her cries tore at his heart until it was impossible to sit still. He stood and paced the floor. At times, her groans were so intense he could not quell his panic. His mother had died giving birth to him, and that was a sorrow he could never forget. Now it was her turn to give birth to his own child. Childbirth was a passage most women experienced, a passage fraught with danger, including the possibility of death. Reminding himself what he learned from a monk a number of months earlier, Siddhartha sat down in a lotus position and began to take hold of his mind and his heart. This time of passage was a true test. He must maintain calm and even heart amidst her cries. So you're seeing, it, for me, it's interesting because I, I guess I assume like Buddha never had any difficult emotions and probably didn't really love his wife if he left her. But in this passage, we kind of hear the tenderness of like his love and his care and his concern for her. And he has a, um, a young boy. Um, so when he, he's told that Gopa is what he, the affectionate name for his wife, Yasodhara, Gopa has given birth to a boy. So Dartha smiled and looked at his mother with gratitude. I will name the child Rahula. And it's interesting. So the very first time he goes to visit her, see, this is the description. Yasodhara gazed at him, her shining eyes filled with love. Their son lay by her side, swaddled in silk. He could see only his plump little face. Um, Siddhartha picked Rahula up, lifted the infant in his arms, 
and he felt as though he were floating, yet his heart was heavy with worry. And I am not a parent, but I have heard this from many parents, like your first day of becoming a parent, like your heart explodes and you also realize you now have no control. Am I, do I get that kind of right parents in the room? <laughs> right. So just this like huge amount of love and realizing, holy shit, I can't actually protect this beautiful being. Um, and in his case, I think the worry is twofold. Um, for him, he says, uh, he actually says that as he's holding his own child, he he really remembers this time when him and Yasodahara visited the four-year-old child who Yasodahara couldn't save in the village. And they went to the funeral of this four-year-old child and so watched its body being taken from the home to the river and being burnt. And it was such a moving experience. And uh, at that time, Siddhartha felt like crying <clears throat> and his he was filled with tears. And he said, child, oh child, where now do you return? So just this sense of, you know, death and birth and without a clear understanding of the relationship between one lifetime to a next, at least for Siddhartha, such despair at the end of a life. And in seeing, um, and I think feeling this immense amount of love, it also brings up this immense amount of fear and realizing what you can't control. Um, and a lot of this, again, kind of last chapters before he truly leaves everything, it's him really recognizing this impermanence, you know, that everything is so fragile <clears throat> everything can change um and the very next chapter here on chapter 12 um is the first one of the first outings of the family together that's kind of a, a bit of a famous story but chana who is like the attendant to the buddha <clears throat> will come up again <clears throat> he lets them out on a, or they all go out on a, intending to go to a picnic. Pleasant sunlight streamed down on the tender green leaves, birds sang on the blossoming branches and of the rose apple trees. Chana let the horses trot at a leisurely pace. Country folk recognizing Siddhartha, Siddhartha and Yasodhara stood and waved in greeting. When they approached the banks of the Banganga River, Chana pulled the reins and brought the carriage to a sudden halt. Locking the road before them was a man who had collapsed. His arms and legs were pulled in towards his chest. His whole body shook. Moans escaped his half-open mouth. Siddhartha jumped down, followed by Chana. The man lying in the road looked less than 30 years old. Siddhartha picked up his hand and said to Chana, it looks as though he's come down with a bad flu, don't you think? Let's massage him and see if it helps. Can you imagine in this day and age? Anyway, I think this is a very different time or person or being. <laughs> um, Chana shook his head. Your Highness, these aren't the symptoms of a bad flu. I'm afraid he's contracted something far worse. This is a disease for which there's no known cure. Are you sure? Siddhartha gazed at the man. Couldn't we take him to the royal physician? Your Highness, even the royal physician can't cure this disease. I've heard this disease is highly infectious. If we take him in our carriage, he might infect you, your wife and son, and even yourself. Please let go of his hand. And Siddhartha does not want to let go of his hand. But when he um, th suddenly looks up, he realizes that from a riverbank, there came cries of mourning. And he saw a funeral taking place and the funeral pyre. And the sound of chanting of intertwined with the grief stricken cries and the crackling fire. So he's just getting like all these intense messages of impermanence. And after he turns his gaze back from the funeral pyre, this man has died, right? Who he's massaging his hand. And there's just, you know, this really, obviously they, well, not obviously, but they don't continue on their picnic voyage, right? They turn around and really Siddhartha is having these just intense feelings of remorse for his child 
that his child is born into this world in which sickness, old age, and suffering, there's still no way to really manage or deal with, um, you know, our own sense of fear, anxiety, and frustration around those realities. And that he himself, you know, because he hasn't actually gotten to figure out who he is in the world and find what is his calling, that he will not be a good dad. Again, I'm not a parent, but I can imagine, right? That that feeling of, my God, here's my child. I can't protect them for the world. And actually, can I fulfill my own dreams, desires, and needs? So like just some very authentic uh, material here. And that night, um, it's interesting. There's a, not as much in, in Thich Nhat Hanh's book as in others, but so a lot of talk of dreams and prophetic dreams in um, in Buddhism. And in, in this case, uh, Yasodhara has a series of dreams that night after they had this really difficult encounter with this dying man. Um, but the dreams are prophetic and really kind of they it's. Uh, there's, I, I don't really want to read the whole thing, but I'll give you a snippet. Flowers of every color dripped from the rain and the skies and the sound of celestial singing echoed everywhere throughout the capital. She heard a loud voice that shook the heavens. The time has come. And then there's a big um, elephant and all these other symbols. But when she woke up, she knew that Siddhartha would be leaving her soon. And she woke up at fear, like shaking him and said, will you be leaving? Don't leave. And so she kind of had this prophecy. And, and it's interesting, small aside, I think we should spend some class really looking at the dream consciousness, because there's so much written about <clears throat> dreaming, dying, and waking consciousness. And it's often said that if we can't wake up in our dreams, it's a good way to show us how we will be dying. When we're dying, we aren't recognizing actually that our, our body has left and our consciousness is still stuck in a sense of relative reality. But if we can wake up or become lucid in our dreams, recognize the illusion, not only are we preparing for death, we're actually able to see life more clearly. So there's a metaphor saying that we're always walking around in a dreamlike state before we recognize like the true illusion of the projected world we live in. So again, maybe a little bit like trying to pull it back to the meditation. So if we are always feeling like that sound is bad or that driver is bad or that bus is bad, we're kind of dreaming right? We're seeing, we're not actually happen. What's happening in the moment is like our projected reality. When we're dreaming, you know, we're not actually do, you know, in the streets with these beautiful colored flowers, seeing elephants, but we don't know the difference. And so it's said that when we live in ignorance, when we're not seeing reality as it is, it's like we're dreaming. And then that interesting part about, if we can learn to be wakeful in our dreams, we can learn to prepare to die. That's like real motivation, I'd say, to start waking up in our dreams. Um, and there's some good resources. Yeah, both Josh and I listened to this episode of uh, Andrew Holacek, who's a, I would say, Andrew Holacek and Alan Wallace, of the two I've read about and seen such incredible writing and teaching on lucid dreaming, dream yoga. <laughs> So you think about how much of your time you're sleeping, you could be practicing mm -hmm. and not to get you striving or like doing more, but it's, it's a really like rich opportunity. We sleep a lot and just, you know, personally, I've been experimenting with it only for the last month and it's really different. It's, you know, I have to say as someone who wakes up a lot in the night has shifted my relationship to waking up in the night where usually I'm like, Oh shit. And then I'm like, oh, cool. I'm probably going to go back into a dream. Okay. Remember I'm dreaming. Remember I'm dreaming, right? All these little tricks and tools of lucid dreaming. So anyway, just a little aside. And the person I think has written the most beautifully on these states of consciousness is Evan Thompson. He's a philosopher out of UBC um, in British Columbia. And he was present at this meeting with His Holiness the Dalai Lama, Francisco Varela, and a bunch of other dream researchers in 1994. And they really got into like, what is dreaming? 
like, what is it? It's so cool. Most of us dream almost every night. And yet like really understanding, not like what does my dream mean, but what is it, what its potential is. So just a little aside here. Um, so it's interesting. Here we are, really tense moment. Siddhartha is like, Siddhartha, wake up. Um, are these dreams an omen that you will soon leave me in order to go and seek the way? Siddhartha fell silent and then consoled her. Gopa, please don't worry. You are a woman of depth. You are my partner, the one who can help me truly fulfill my quest. You understand me more than anyone else. If in the near future I must leave and travel far from you, I know you possess the courage to continue your work. You will care for and raise our child well. Though I am gone, though I am far away from you, my love remains the same. I will never stop loving you. With that knowledge, you'll be able to endure our separation. And when I've found the way, I'll return to you and our child. What do we think? Is that good enough? It works for her in this version. And I will say, and we'll get into this later, you know, and this is not true for everyone in this room I, I, and online, I understand, but this book is really written from the point of view and the perspective of many, many lifetimes. And so we'll see another story of when Siddhartha and Yasodhara were together another time and in which she fell in love with him, <laughs> spoiler alert. And he said, I am totally dedicated to seeking the way. And she said, and he said, it won't be in this lifetime, but that is my purpose. And she said, in this and every lifetime, in this lifetime and every lifetime to come, I'll support you. And so when he's saying this to her, it's not like, it's okay, honey, go back to bed. Like, we're good. It's like, this is our sacred pact. Super beautiful. It, yeah, it's rough. <laughs> it's rough. So the next day, Siddhartha went to speak to his father. It was so interesting. So like, there's your beloved, right? And you're like, I'll love you forever. Like, that's my, that's what I'll tell you. And he says, my royal father, I ask your permission to leave home and become a monk in order to see, seek the path of enlightenment. As we remember, you know, his father has was told by a wise man before Siddhartha was born that this would happen. He's been worried. Siddhartha is always going to hang out with monks whenever he gets a chance. King Sudohana was greatly alarmed. He had long known this day might arrive, but he hadn't thought it would come so abruptly. After a long moment, he looked at his son and answered, in the history of our family, we've had a few become monks, but no one has ever done it at your age. They all waited till they were past 50. Why can't you wait? Your son is small. The whole country is relying on you. And he says, father, a day on the throne would be like a day sitting on a bed of hot coals for me. If my heart has no peace, how can I fulfill your or other people's trust in me? I have seen how quickly time passes. I know my youth is no different. Please grant me your permission. So we see there how that recognition of impermanence, that man who was like almost his same age, who he saw die before him, and like all, all these other signs of impermanence around him. The king tried to dissuade his son. You must think of your homeland, your parents, Gyasodahara, and your son, who's still an infant. Father, it is precisely because I do think of all of you that I now ask your permission to go. It is not that I wish to abandon my responsibilities. You know, uh, Father, you know that you cannot free me from the suffering in my heart any more than you can release the suffering in your heart. Who so this, you know, um, you know, this real clear and different point of view about what is needed. And he says, Siddhartha, you know how much I need you. You're the only one I've placed all my hopes in. Don't abandon me. I will never abandon you. I'm only asking you to let me go away for a time. When I have found the way, I will return. So just, yeah, just really... Really just, I'd say like sweet to hear how he's trying to get the people in his life to understand his choice and not backing down. Really tough. 
I definitely don't have like a whole kingdom and king and all that. And still like explaining, you know, my choices, right? Yeah, I'm going on retreat silently away from you for a week, right? To my father um, or to people we care about. It, it is, it's really tough to explain this kind of, you know, knowing that investing and cultivating the clarity and the warmth of our heart and mind is truly altruistic and not selfish. It's a really hard one. You know, we have to believe it and know it. And then we have to be able to share that clearly with others because it does go against the stream, right? It is not going with kind of the normal um, goals of our everyday society and what people look at as success. Um, Ironically, his dad doesn't know him well because he then tries to make sure he stays in the palace by inviting those same guys who have those boring parties to talk about politics. They're like, you guys should come party more so that he stays. Um, and in fact, it's after one of just such those parties that Siddhartha leaves. Another party, even more dancing girls. And um, and in I guess in, in, in this telling, such a great... Uh, piece I've heard uh, Bob Thurman talk about when he really stands up for Yasodhara and uh, for Siddhartha's wife and, you know, tries to, yeah, give a little clarity on um, how that wasn't the, the most compassionate choice, even though sometimes it's written about that way. And in, in this version, Yasodhara prepares Siddhartha's travel clothes, saddles the horse, like really is like, I get he's leaving, like you have my blessing, essentially. So that's this version. Um, I like a happy story, so I'll, I'll go with that. And he takes off into the night, you know, just like riding as fast as he can. And Chana, his attendant, comes with him. And yeah, it's good, good cliffhanger for next week is uh, he, you know, he says here, um, Siddhartha waited until, until Chana and the two horses were out of sight before he turned towards the forest to enter his new life. The sky would now serve as his roof and the forest as his home. A sense of ease and contentment welled within him. After a long final day in the palace and an autumn night spent on the back of a horse, Siddhartha now experienced a marvelous ease. He sat in meditation to savor and nurture the feeling of release and freedom that had filled him from the moment he entered the forest. Sunlight filtered through the trees to came, and came to rest on Siddhartha's eyelashes. He opened his eyes and saw standing before him a monk. So good fortune. His very first activity on the path was finding a spiritual friend, a Kalyana Mitra. So we'll hear about the spiritual friend and his first teachings um, next week. But yeah, first, um, I think it's, I find it really inspiring to think again about just this lived experience of one human being and his quest for this path. And again, in the first chapters of the book, just really recognizing the factors of awakening by looking around and seeing injustice, inequality, and then looking around and seeing impermanence. These storms, I hesitate to say this because there's a couple other ocean devotion surfers in the room, but these storms have so polluted our oceans that those of us crazy enough to get in any way are risking various diseases. And um, I've, I've long held just this great worry of a time in my life when I will no longer be able to go into the ocean because it'll be so polluted. And just for me, that's one of those like real, like knife in the heart impermanence remembrances. And I think about how much relief joy, how much I really put into the ocean to be okay. And it does inspire me more to this practice, which even if I can't go into the ocean, will support me. And I do think impermanence and reflecting on it, though super hard on the heart, is a really important factor for us really dedicating ourselves to awakening.
So I'll end on that bummer of a note for you all. But, but next week, we get into the real fun parts of learning the foundations of concentration. So let's take a moment and dedicate the merit together. So recollecting and regathering our attention and awareness in the body. I'm really feeling that spark <clears throat> of motivation from the recognition that this precious human life is so fragile and such an incredible opportunity to practice. And the realities of sickness and old age, I'm feeling a bit of that pressure as an inspiration to really dedicate ourselves to the path and to get it, dedicate the work on the path so that all beings would know happiness and the true causes of happiness, that all beings would be free from suffering and know the true causes of their suffering, that all beings and our planet could be free. Thank you all so much. We have announcements. First among them, I'm going to be here a couple more weeks um, as Chandra is still healing some health stuff that makes it harder for her to show up and teach. So I'll be here in person the next couple of weeks. And Mace has other exciting things to tell us.